My friend, ladies and gentlemen, Benny of the Void in the yeah, building. Hell yeah. What's up, brother? What's up, guys? How you doing? We're doing no. better now, man. We we appreciate you. Uh Benny, if somebody has never heard of your band, can you please properly introduce yourself? Let me know whereabouts in the world you're kicking it right now. Plug and promote anything and everything. What's up? I'm Benny. I sing in a void. I'm from Seattle, Washington, and that's where I'm hanging out right now. Um, my band kicks ass and you should listen to them. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. Add a void kicks ass on just about everything. Dude, this is a pleasure. I appreciate you joining. I think whatever was the first song I actually ever heard from you guys, and I deep dive cult mentality. It's fantastic. Uh, you guys have been around for a long time, man. What's it like going to, you're going to uh, overseas here shortly, right? Uh, not yet, but hopefully hoping to next year. But we have nothing overseas yet. We're going out in the States with Pop Evil and the Word Alive uh, in like, March, April, and then after that, we're kind of we we don't have anything announced yet, but we're cooking up some some pretty cool stuff that we will be announcing in the coming months. Gotcha, unannounced stuff. Excellent, excellent. Hell yeah. When when we when we checked out the the whatever video, it's totally like a comedy based video. I'm I'm curious if you came up with the concept and uh, were you a fan of Crabcore back in the day? Oh, uh, hey, of course I was a fan of Crabcore back in the day. Who wasn't like? It's really so it was the, the idea of the music video honestly kind of came up at the same time we wrote the song. It was it went hand in hand. We didn't know exactly how we were going to pull off the music video, of course. But we were like when we wrote the song and had the lyrical meaning, it was like, OK, we have to like make this full circle when we do the video. It's like it's just begging to be made fun of. Like, let's do it. And then we we toyed around with a couple ideas of it, but it really uh, Chris, uh, our guitar player, and me do a uh, he he's like a video guy for other bands and stuff too, and it's like one of his professions. So he spearheads most of our video projects, and then a lot of it's him and I. We sit down and come up with a broad concept, and then we work with our video guy and really hone it in. And that's kind of what we did with this one. Is it's like we knew we wanted to make fun of like the the stuff we all grew up on the every my favorite bands was, i remember when i was in middle school and i saw a forest music video for the first time and i was like yo <laughs> dude that's crazy uh and it's like it's, it's supposed to be all in good fun you know what i mean it's like it's totally just like making fun of the things we all know and love and we all came up on it and we can all kind of agree that it's a little outdated now and it's like because even bigger than just like the crab core thing the song in general is just about how kind of like when we're all pursuing music and or anything creative but taking the scene for example i just think it's funny that it's such a competition and such like a dick swinging contest all the time between these bands because it's like it doesn't need to be we're all doing the same thing it's like it might be a little bit of a different genre but take anyone make i mean whether you're a rapper whether you're a rock whether you're metal whether you're pop we're all trying to pursue music and be creative and it's like whether you you're and a lot of the time we're playing in the same venues when we're coming up it's like you look at any mid-sized venue that any metalcore tour is coming through and it has pop artists and rappers and it's like we're all really doing the same thing and it doesn't need to be a competition we should all just like it should be sick that we're all out here and so it's just kind of making fun of that mentality of like i'm better than you or i'm cooler than you it's just like no nah, man i've slept in the van you've slept in the van i've eaten fucking mayo packets for dinner and so have you like you know <laughs> it's like what are we doing here like it doesn't gotta support to everybody like gotta support exactly. everybody uh I, I when doing a little bit of research for this i saw that you guys were the first band signed to to thriller records a Indeed. can we have a it is called local band smoke we have a lot of local bands smaller bands that watch can you talk about the process of signing a record deal and how scary is it to be the first artist for a particular label all right we're totally we're totally back i'm sorry about that if you could finish answering that question sir i'm sorry oh yeah no worries my friend yeah basically so when we signed a thriller it was actually like a transitional deal almost like from our other label like we we got technically like I don't know, it, we didn't officially not be on revival if that makes sense we were we were kind of moved up which was really cool it doesn't happen to everyone but just the process in general of like signing a record deal i mean 
it's all the boring stuff. You just got to go back and forth on like terms and stuff. And you got to make sure that if you're even entertaining to sign to a label or anything, like make sure that you know what you want out of the label and what you want to get. And, and so after like, it's really just a lot of those questions. It's like, all right, well, we want to do this, 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 and this. Can you help us get that? Uh, but like, I don't know. It's, it, it's such a, it's such a weird thing. Cause I, I think in this day and age, I love being on a record label, but I also think that it is very, like most bands can be pretty resourceful these days and do a lot of it without a record label. So like my advice to any up and coming, like smaller bands that are looking to sign or anything like that is basically don't make it a priority of yours. Like just focus on being sick and playing shows and write and making good content, especially nowadays, like content is key. And like, you can't focus on one more than the other because you also like you have to have good content. You also have to be good. So it's like it's like a little bit of both. Right. But I don't know, like make sure that you are just trying to get the most out of like like whatever situation you're coming into. Like that, that's really like the biggest thing I could say is it's like record labels and stuff like that is not end all be all. And I think focusing on that too much can uh, water down the craft, if you know what I mean. Like makes sense. Like. Like we never, I mean, we obviously always wanted to get signed to a record label. We didn't like go out and be like, we're going to get signed today. We just kind of did our thing and eventually record labels took notice. And that's like the biggest thing is it's like, if you do your thing and do it well and get your name out there, record label, like people start taking notice. And honestly, really like quicker than you think, like when you're a smaller band than you think, if you just get one thing that circulates a little bit well, the doors open and, and that's when you can start thinking about that stuff. But like, yeah, just be sick and focus on being <laughs> sick and literally everything will come with it. Focus on being sick. Heard, I like that. Uh, Betty, I'm, I'm going to give it over to my boy JB. He's my co-host. So he's going to ask you a couple questions. But before I send it over to him, I want to know if you're down to do some trivia. I don't know if management told you we do a trivia portion on the show. I would love to. Do you happen to have any hot sauce? Uh, no, not on deck. Okay, we'll say beer chugs then. If I stump you, we'll do beer chugs. But the cool That's thing is perfect. you get to pick the topic. What movie or TV show have you seen the most? Where if I ask you trivia on this movie or TV show, you will not get Ooh. stumped. Oh, man, probably How I Met Your Mother or The Office. Okay, I definitely have a lot of Office trivia. JB, take it away. Give me a second to look up some trivia. Yo, it's a pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much for being here, brother. Oh, uh, man, thanks for having me, bro. When it, when it comes to everything uh, with the void, which song uh, was it where you were just like, holy holy, we we're gonna fucking you know we're gonna we're gonna make this like this is a possibility for us to do something with this. The hey mama I made it moment. <laughs> it's weird because I I they they've come in really small doses and I would even say it's like when it comes to writing, I I wouldn't know if I've ever felt like. Because I think that, like, in the early days, you'd be like, oh, we finally did it. And then that song doesn't go anywhere. And then the songs that have gone, it's not like we thought they were bad songs or anything, but it's, like, it's it's weird with that. But I'd say the hey, like, like those moments are, like, when we played, like, Welcome to Rockville at Daytona Speedway and, like, got to play main stage at Louder Than Life and have gotten to do these national tours now. It's, like, when you can see it happening in front of you every night and like watch a crowd of people, like start to learn your words and stuff like that. That's when you go start to be like, Oh shit. Okay. We're not just, we're not just doing playing bars to no one anymore. Like people like may, might give a little bit of a fuck about this. And so that's really cool. But the a song that did give me like a big moment like that <clears throat> would have been, we wrote Cowabunga for the new record cult mentality. Cause that record kind of took a minute to get done. And we, we tried a few different times and it just didn't come out right. And we weren't writing the right songs. And it was just like, okay, that's close, but it's not it. And we knew it wasn't it. And, and that's why we never tried to rush getting the record out or anything. Like it took a minute to get a record out after putting out the burner, but it took a minute to get it right. And I remember we were having pretty gnarly, like writer's block. It wasn't even like writer's block. We were like writing shit. It was just like, it just wasn't it. You know what I mean? And then uh, I sat down with uh, our producer, KJ, or one of our producers, and, and he had been playing around like a guitar melody earlier that day, and it really stuck with me. And we went out to dinner, and I was like, man, I'm bummed we're not getting this stuff done. Like, whoa. And he was just like, well, yo, let's get back, and let's just fucking write no, no thoughts in mind. Let's just get something done. And I remember, like, he just started playing those chords again. And I was like, dude, I love that. And I started humming along the melody, like, na, 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 na. And, and then, like, and I put it in a voice note and I listened to it back. And it, from the fucking voice note, I was like, ooh, we got something. 
oh, we got something. <laughs> and it was like, it was literally just like acoustic guitar and like humming. It's the but best it feeling like, ever when you know you got something was, too. Ex- it's the best feeling ever. And it was also very validating to feel like the other songs weren't there yet. Cause it's like, sometimes we were trying to be like, oh, well maybe it's just not mixed right yet. Or maybe we need a different thing on this to make it sound better. But I truly believe that a good song is a good song down to its bare bones. And if you can't just hum along to it and have a shitty acoustic guitar behind it and it be good, then it's probably not very good. So it was like a really good feeling to be like, okay, fuck yeah. This is the most bare bones of an idea and it's sick already and then literally that night we went right down we were living in a band house at the time we had like a little studio set up downstairs and nick and paul were already down working on some shit and we just like that night got like the first like rendition of what became cowabunga out and it really became like all of our baby because like paul and nick especially like really strove into it and chris really he came out of it because he lived in the bedroom down there and then he comes out and he starts adding stuff to the pot and it really just became like we were all like so excited and so motivated to get this song done. And then I remember that night uh, we had like a really shitty, shitty demo of it that we had like bounced out and I fell asleep listening to it. And that'd been like the first time through the whole record process that I'd been like so stoked on a song that I like kept listening to it and was just like super, super, super stoked. So that song really like gave me that, like that tickle in your belly when you feel really excited. Who's your favorite Ninja Turtle? Oh, fuck. Raphael. Oh yeah, he's he's the he's the tough one, the tough one to break through too. <laughs> Let's I'm not try. The biggest Ninja Turtles guy, as much as it's Cowabunga, it's it's not even a Ninja Turtles reference. But do you get that all the time though? All the time. I bet it was really supposed to kind of just be because to me that song just sounded like fun and like California, like beaches and stuff like that. And I was just thinking like how, and I I didn't. I, I spelled it wrong in the voice note, but like I, I had the name Cowabunga that night too. I was just like, uh, that that's just what it, it felt like the word Cowabunga is really all I can describe for that song. And it, there was no changing the name of it any way. It was like, no, this is Cowabunga. This is what it feels like. Well, my friend, let's see if you've seen The Office as many times as you say you have. Let's do it. In an episode called The Injury, Michael grills a part of his body on the George Foreman grill. His foot. His foot is correct! Yeah, hell yeah. Damn it! Uh, I will take the hot sauce. I'll do the beer chug. Woo. Well, Seattle is very cannabis friendly area. Do you, my oh, very, friend, do you partake? Of course. Excellent. Uh, sativa, indica, a little mix of both, hybrid style. What's your preference? I'm actually, I'm, a, I'm a hybrid guy. I like a, I like a sativa leading hybrid because I, especially now in my very, I've, I'm a seasoned stoner to this day, if you will. And I've always felt that like, Excellent. if you have a good hybrid, uh, you can kind of go into it before you smoke and mentally get out of it what you want. Like if you need to be in the couch and just chill, you can do that. If you need to get shit done, you can do that. And I felt that like if something like a little too indica e or something's a little too sativa e, I can go a little too far in the direction. But I like being able to like control what I need to do, and so I feel like I get that out with hybrids. One hundred percent agree. Uh, JB, I'm gonna try one more time. I'm gonna just st- ramp it up a little bit on the trivia. It's something a little tougher for sure. What is your next question for for Benny? <clears throat> uh, Benny, uh, have you lived in Washington your whole life, or born and raised? Okay, so I want to know your, I want to know your your favorite story about maybe downtown Seattle, because when I went there, holy moly, the it was absolutely something totally different than I ever have expected. So I want to know your point of, of view of uh, downtown <laughs> Seattle. Dude, downtown Seattle's kind of wild sometimes, but it's like I I've always like had really good times there, <laughs> like. Um, so I, especially like before the pandemic, I worked at this uh, venue in Seattle called El Corazon. And uh, there was always, there was this homeless guy. Oh my God. Why can't I remember his name? Uh, let's just call him Brad for the sake of the story. Uh, it's His name is not Brad, but, uh, <laughs> but Brad would always come around the venue when we were working. And he was like, 
he was like he was like super drunk and you would kind of like from the from like the outside like see you'd think that it was just like oh no this guy's just like a drunk guy that's super far gone and da, 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 da. and then i like started hearing stories about him like through the seattle area and like i guess he's been like a homeless person there for like 15 years and like just just knows the streets super well and i would hear these stories about this guy that like girls have like been like yo like i was in like an alley and uh and like a guy came up on me and was trying to like fuck on me and like brad came out of nowhere and like got this guy off of me and like and there was like a bunch of these stories and i'm just like dude are you a superhero (laughs) like yeah and i'm just like legend it's just like great. It's like that's just like the first thing that comes to mind. That's one of my favorite things about like a story of like this random homeless guy that's actually just like a superhero that has like saved multiple people from horrible events. In Shout downtown. out to Brad. Hell yeah. Shout out to Brad, Yo. dude. He's the <laughs> best, bro. And I just think that that's like it's cool because like there's a lot of random stories. I feel like that ha- like there's obviously bad shit that happens too, but I feel like you see like Seattle has a really good community to it, which I think is really cool and. Like, obviously, I feel like you you can see all the shit on the news and stuff like that if you want to get a bad warp view of Seattle. But, like, I think that, like, and it's kind of like even if you hear, like, from the 90s and like even hear Dave Grohl, like, why he moved to Seattle. It's, like, it's a big city with a small town vibe, which I still feel like it has to this day. Like, especially, I haven't worked downtown in a minute, but I did for a while and a bunch of my friends worked downtown. And it really, it's just a community. And I'd say that most big cities, if you like are working in downtown and are like the backbone of big parts, it's like, it really becomes like a family. And I think it's cool that like, I don't know, people really look out for each other here. And I like that. That is awesome. Uh, Chad is saying that you guys were playing the observatory in Southern California, Santa Ana, April 10th. Indeed. So we're going to do our best to, to come out and support you for sure. Oh dude, we got you guys hit me up. Like, uh, I, SoCal is always hard with guest lists and stuff like that. But like, if I can get you guys in, I will, or whatever, I'll get you guys merch. Whatever we can do, we'll hook you guys up. Much appreciated. Yeah, oh, I, I will I will not miss it for sure. Definitely brings the people out and support. But uh, we're going to try this one more time in the trivia. I feel like this one's a little harder. We've had people on the show that have said The Office, and I think we're like four out of five times we stump people with this particular question, and they always guess the same thing and they're wrong. Let's see if we can get you, Vinny. All right. In the episode, The Fire, who actually started the fire? Oh, shit. Um, bonus was points, it Michael? Bonus points if you could name how they started it. It is not Michael. It was either, it was either Michael or Dwight, I want to say. Or was it Ryan? Motherfucker. I don't fucking know. It is Ryan. Yeah, it yeah. is Ryan? But I'm going to say that we kind of stumped you because it was the third guess. So let's chug some beer. Honestly, well, you said it was like a tough question, and I haven't watched it in a minute. And, like, Ryan came – because there's a, there's like a song in that is Ryan started the fire. Right, and right. that was, like, the first thing that came to mind. But then I was like, wait, I haven't seen that episode in a while. Maybe he didn't start the fire, and, like, Michael started it and blamed it on him, and that's why – so I thought you were trying to get me. I almost had you. He leaves the pita in the toaster oven too long. And it, yeah. ca- it causes the fire. Damn it. You have seen yeah. that show a bunch, man. Well done. Oh, man, I love that show. Benny, we only have time for a couple more questions. I'm sorry it's so short. But uh, tell me tell me the worst show that Avoid ever played. Everything went actually, wrong at this show. It was actually the most recent show we played. The last show of the Plot and You Tour in uh, Minnesota. Everything went wrong. The last show of the year, last show of tour, and this has been we we like we crushed this tour. We had been feeling so good about ourselves, and like we felt really good about our playing. Uh, like the crowd reactions were insane. Like it had just become like clockwork at that point. And literally the last fucking show of tour, after a month of good shows, you're, and we're done for the year. We know we're gonna be off for a couple months. You're ready to just like get settled in and like end on a high note. Show is sold out at like 700 tickets. It's just fucking packed to the bone. And yeah, we got like during our first song, uh, Chris's guitar cut out. And then like halfway through the second song, tracks and bass cut out. And then like the backing tracks and everything. Yeah. And we, and we run, we run a backtrack bass. So that wasn't like, like through the computer. So that wasn't going through anymore. Uh, and then all of our, we, we do like, 
almost all of our shit's digital, like our amps and stuff like that. It all runs through the computer. So if the computer goes, if the computer's fucked, we're fucked. And the computer was fucked. So we were fucked. Dang. <laughs> did, you, did you finish the set? Or, and if so, how? It kind of just ended up being like 15 minutes of me doing bad stand-up comedy and Paul doing a drum solo. <laughs> Um, and, uh, uh, basically we like attempted to play a couple songs without tracks by the end and it went well. And like, by the time we did it, the crowd was going crazy, but I mean, it was 20 minutes of me just standing there trying to figure out what to say and do. Oh shit. Everything's broken. I don't know what to do. Fuck. Um, but you know, it's honestly, I think like the biggest thing out of that is it was really good to learn from that. Cause we haven't had a situation like that come up in a long time. And I don't know if we've ever had one like that, like that where everything stopped working. And it did like, like, I think we absolutely made the best of that situation, but like it stumped us. And it, especially me, like as a front man, that was a big challenge. And I learned a lot from that moment. And, and like, not that I'm like looking forward to it ever happening again, but I have a lot of confidence. Like if that ever happens again, you got like, better jokes know, this time. Oh, better jokes yeah. this time. <laughs> Hell yeah. God damn it. <laughs> JV, what's your final question for Betty? I got a serious one after this to end on a high note. Please. So my, my final question is, uh, do you have anything uh, going for music other than a void? Do you have any side projects or anything that you're working on? No, I, I just do a void for my music outlet. Like, I, uh, it's just my baby. I fucking, like, I started, I started a void when I was like 14. And, oh, right or avoid the void is is the band that became a void but like this is really like all i know like i just love doing stuff for a void and i mean i've thought about it and like i've featured on other people's songs and stuff like that but like I, i've never really done another project i would like to but it's definitely not a priority if that makes sense like a void is the priority and and anytime i even feel like i want to start working on something my mind would just like Oh, how could I use this for a void? And how could I? And so it's just kind of like that. That's really my my main focus right now. Like I would totally do it, but it's just it's not my number one priority. So it when time comes, I definitely will or not opposed to it. But no, not right now. Two questions, one to roll off that. If someone wants to hire you, pay you for your services, get a feature vocally, how would they go about that? Oh wow, uh, I'm a dick, dude. I hate doing them. So um, <laughs> I I. Uh, I don't know. You can DM me on Instagram. You can reach out to our management. Uh, but I'm just super picky. It's not even even if I like like the people or like, even like the song. It's just like I've never been I've never been like a big guest vocal guy, and I've never wanted to like do it too much. So it's like it has to like kind of mean something to me also in a way, if that makes sense. Which is sure. like, I totally know that that's not like everyone's thing. And like, but yeah, like you could totally like shoot me a DM or like reach out to our management and like, I might be into it, but like for the most part, it's like, I don't know, it's just not, again, I, I, I just like working on a void and like doing stuff like that. And so I, get I don't it. really have, if, if it's not like something I'm 1000% into, like, I don't want to waste either of our time. You know what I mean? Because it's like, if I'm not into it, I'm just going to give you a shitty guest part that I'm not into. Like, that's not sick either. Right. Like, that's not cool to either. And you can hear it on the track. It's just like, no, nah, it's like, I I'd rather just be like, no, nah, I'm good. Or fuck yeah, I'm super into that. Let's do it. Like, but yeah, so that's how you, so if you want to do it, you can hit me up that way. But like, don't get mad at me. if They'll I probably no. hate it, but, but shoot your it's, shot it's and give it a try. Per it's nothing personal. I swear. Uh, final question. It's a serious one. I ask almost every guest that we have on the show this final question. What is a piece of musical advice somebody in the industry gave you that you consider the best advice you were ever given? You you apply it to your craft daily. Oh, man. I think that like the biggest thing I learned, well, I guess there's two parts to this answer because I learned a lot of stuff when I was young that I feel like got a void to where we were able to then shift our thinking to other things. Cause you have to, cause it's like any band start that you have to break a threshold of even like being in a point where you can hopefully even locally tour or like sell out of a room or like kind of get respect for, from other venues and stuff like that. And so I'll say this with this too. I'll preference it to start this. Like don't fuck yourself over by any means and don't put yourself in a position where you're getting used or like, really just like like and just like don't do that and i'm not promoting like just fucking like eating shit and sucking for a few but 
the best advice I got when I was like 14 was it's like, it takes four years of being serious with a band for you to start getting any sort of traction. And obviously you can look up anomalies and you can look up like, you can find fights for that, but like take most things. Like it takes four years of dedicated work after you get to that threshold for you to even start getting anywhere. To even get to the point where the four years is even serious, you're going to fucking eat shit and you're going to eat a little bit more shit and you're going to eat some more shit until you get to where you want to be. And uh, so that's what, know your worth. Don't fuck yourself over and get yourself in bad positions. But also if you're just trying to make it and you're like, I'm fucking great at what I do. I know I'm this. I know I'm that. I know I'm that. And you can't get anyone to recognize you play that show and that that isn't for a lot of money and 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 get yourself out there and just fucking like like don't be afraid to grind a little bit and, and make some dumb decisions for the sake of getting your name out there because it goes a lot farther than you think and you never know who you're going to meet and on the other hand but like I said be smart about it don't just don't just do stupid things <laughs> but like if you know you're if you believe in yourself and and it might not be the most like financially or mentally thing that makes sense it's like why would you do that but you kind of have this feeling inside it's like but if i do that and this goes to this and this goes to this like take that chance and fucking go for it and be unconventional and go for that and then if you're lucky enough to get to a point where you can get to where it's like all right now this is kind of a business and how do i take it the next step further and it's just never be afraid to be humbled never be afraid to learn always learn and just pay attention to everything that's going on around you because the the industry really does kind of teach itself to you if you just like ask the right questions and don't ask too many questions and just like watch and and pay and just pay attention like it'll really it'll show you it'll show yourself how it works absolutely sound fantastic advice Benny, this is a lot of fun. I appreciate you, brother. Stay safe on the road. I'll see you Dude, April 10th. Me, man. It was yes, an absolute yeah. honor. It was a pleasure. We'll hit you up about the show. If you haven't followed Avoid already, you're missing out. They kick ass. I promise you, ladies and gentlemen, Benny of Avoid! Give me a hell Woo! yeah! Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys.